Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we'll talk with Jason Sue. He's the founder and CIO of Raliant, a firm that combines quantitative investing with fundamental investing, and they call it quantumental investing. We'll talk with him. He's a great guy. It'll be a lot of fun. This week in the mailbag, I have a single mailbag item about how to buy Bitcoin. In my opening rant this week, I'll talk about a topic that I plan to mention frequently. You know, maybe maybe once a year, maybe twice, but I was reminded of it recently while listening to two investors talk about equity returns since the peak of the internet bubble. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. So I'm going to talk about this topic that I plan to mention with some regularity. I've mentioned it before, and I will mention it again. But first, I have to talk a little bit about Bitcoin, just for a minute. I'm starting to wonder about it just because it trades like a risk asset, right? Risk on, it goes up. Risk off, it goes down. And I'm trying. I'm starting to think about something I never think about, which is like, what's going to happen to the price of this thing in the future if other people are selling, you know? Normally, we care about the fundamental value, but, you know, it's difficult to think about fundamental value with Bitcoin. So if it behaves that way and we get a big market sell-off, you know, do you really want to give up 50% or, you know, 40 or 50% of everything that you've made on Bitcoin? I kind of don't. And Bitcoin is my second biggest winner in, in my Extreme Value newsletter. It's up like 450% in about a year. So that there's a lot to think about there. And I just want everybody to know I'm, I'm still holding Bitcoin. I love the idea of it. I think it's brilliant. I think it has a future. It's the most incredible innovation but I care a lot about, I've recommended it in the pages of Extreme Value. So I care a lot about what happens to that in the Extreme Value portfolio for Extreme Value readers. And, and I'm not just a mindless bull, a mindless Bitcoin perma bull. I care about what, what happens. So just going to put that bug in your ear and move on to this topic, which is the coffee can stocks which I was reminded of recently, I was listening to a couple of investors talk about returns to, to some stocks since the dot-com highs in March of 2000. And since the high in March of 2000, just take Amazon. I think Amazon has compounded at something like 20% a year or something. Since the high, the high of the dot-com, and it got murdered. You know, it was down 60 or 70% or more. You know, it was down a ton. I don't even care what the exact number is because it doesn't matter. I mean, 60, 70, 80, whatever. Murdered. Apple, same thing. Absolutely obliterated. 60, 70, 80%, whatever. From the dot-com high. But Apple has compounded at something like 25% a year. From the highs. You get what I'm saying? You could have bought the thing at the worst moment to buy it. And if you just held on for the long term and thought it was a great company and didn't look at your account and didn't really care from year to year, you'd have made a ton of money, which is pretty amazing. And that reminds me of the story of the coffee can stocks. This is from the Journal of Portfolio Management back in 1984. The Fall of 1984 Journal of Portfolio Management. It's an article by a guy named Robert Kirby, who, when you type Robert Kirby, you know, into a search engine, he's like the coffee can guy. And it's called The Coffee Can Portfolio. And he says you can make more money being passively active than actively passive. And he tells this story when he worked for this firm, even years before he wrote this thing, he said he had this one client who was this woman whose husband 
had died recently and she wanted to put her, his account and her account together into one. And he looked at the two accounts and he was amazed by what he saw, right? So the woman was a bona fide client of the firm and she took all their advice. She bought when they said buy and she sold when they said sell. But the husband was just piggybacking off of her, her advice that she was getting from the firm ex- with one exception. And that one exception was he didn't take their sell advice. He never sold, in fact. He just put 5000 bucks into every buy recommendation and forgot about them, right? So years later, you know, she had, uh, I forget. I mean, I've got the article in front of me, but it doesn't say how much she had. It only says that he had several, I'm quoting from the article, it said, he owned a number of small holdings with values of less than $2,000. He had several large holdings with values in excess of $100,000. There was one jumbo holding worth over $800,000, and that exceeded the total value of his wife's entire portfolio. And that one jumbo holding came from a small commitment in a company called Halloid, which later turned out to be a zillion shares of Xerox. So when he bought Halloid, he probably had no idea it was going to become Xerox and go to the moon and make him like more than $800,000 off of what, a $5,000 stake? It seems like that's that's what he did with every stock. So it's an odd time for me to point this out, isn't it? Because I've been saying that stocks are overvalued and, and even recently I've said it's like they're, they're more expensive than ever before in history, certainly by, by many traditional measures. And, you know, people are more like if you follow um, sentiment trader Jason Gefford, who we've talked to in the program on Twitter – you know, he's saying they're they're nearing an all time record on the sentiment indicators being bullish, right? So I'm saying, hey, be careful. And I also said in the extreme value, or I'm sorry, in the, the Stansberry Daily Digest recently, that the top has begun to form, right? Bottoms are an event, tops are a process, and the process has begun. So why would I choose to point out? That the best that that you should never sell. Do I really want you to buy stocks here and never sell them? Hey, you know me. I'm not going to tell you what to do. You're a grown up, man. You do you do what you think is best. You do you. My point is here, and the reason that I want to want to bring this up is simply that it's hard to be an investor, and it's always hard to be an investor. It's hard at the bottom. It's hard at the top. It's hard in the middle. And what's hard is holding, right? It, the, the, the guys who reminded me of the coffee can, you know, they were talking about stocks at the top of the dot-com, but the coffee can wasn't about the top of the dot-com. It was about just stocks bought over a period of many years and held, right? And, and in that article, you know, he, he goes on to make the point that He's talking about institutional investors because he, you know, this is a journal of portfolio management. He's an institutional guy. That's, you know, that's what that's what his thing is. But, you know, he points out that that even at that time in 1984, he said the methods are a lot different now. You know, it, they, they, he said we make our decisions on a much shorter time horizon. He said, most of us are faster than Wyatt Earp ever dreamed of being when it comes to taking a profit, right? People just don't buy and hold anymore. And you'll hear people say, buy and hold just doesn't work. I I don't know that that's necessarily true, but I know that at all times, all throughout history, buying and holding has been extremely difficult for, for the overwhelming majority of people. It's probably even difficult for the people who actually do it. You know, I'm sure this guy was sweating bullets near the bottom of bear markets while he was holding this stuff. But it seems like, you know, Peter Lynch might be right. You, you, you know, the best way to make money in stocks is not to get scared out of them. And you should remember that. Equity is permanent capital. I was talking to a friend of mine recently who runs a public company. And, you, you know, we're talking about equity and compensation and stuff. And I came away from that conversation thinking, yeah, equity. Equity is permanent capital. And that leads me straight into one of my two quotes of the week this week, 
one of them, they're, they're both by Felix Dennis. He wrote this book called How to Get Rich, which is really a great little book. I love Felix Dennis's book. He's got a great kind of in-your-face style. And one of the quotes is, ownership isn't the important thing. If you want to be rich, it's the only thing. But he also says this other quote, public companies are not sane places and their share prices are not decided by sane people. He, he owned a publishing company. They were the publisher of Maxim Magazine, among other publications. And he passed away, I think, in 2014 or so. Anyway, wealthy, successful guy, had a lot of thoughts about getting rich. And, and the, the thing about ownership is it really is available to you on the public equity market. He's, but he's right. You know, I don't know if public companies are not sane places, but their share prices are not decided by sane people. We can definitely say that. I mean, you know, when we're running stocks like, you know, GameStop up to, I think, like, like I want to say a 15 billion market cap at the top of that recent ridiculous mania, and people are still buying the thing, and it's still way overvalued by any rational assessment. That's not sane. But it's still true that ownership is really ownership of a business. It's, you know, it's hard to beat ownership of a good business as a way to grow wealth, right? Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, like, or Warren Buffett mostly says, you know, if you're not in too much of a hurry, it's kind of easy to get rich. Meaning all you've got to do is buy a bunch of good businesses on the stock exchange and forget about them for 30 or 40 years and boom, chakalaka, you're rich. All right. So, this is a long-term proposition, this thing we do in the stock market. And I just wanted to, to underscore that today. All right. Let's talk with Jason Sue. Uh, let's do it right now, man. Let's go. Okay. Let me just take a moment here and talk about an event that we've all been a part of for the past 12 years, which is simply the tremendous momentum of the stock market. My friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Sugarud, has been bullish for the past 12 years. However, the tides are shifting and Steve is getting worried about how much higher this bull market can go. He believes at some point this year, this year, we will face one of the most critical investing decisions of our lifetimes. And so Steve wants every investor to stop and think right now, do you have an exit plan for stocks? What would a 50% hit on your portfolio mean to you? Would you be able to delay retirement for 10 years? If you're riding the stock market rainbow, take a moment to watch Steve's new video, which is free of charge. Visit MeltdownPrediction.com today. Steve has filmed sharing what he is personally doing to prepare for the inevitable meltdown and explains how his prediction can have a dramatic impact on your wealth in the coming months. The website, again, is MeltdownPrediction.com. Today's guest is Jason Sue, chairman and CIO of Raliant, an asset manager focused on generating alpha from investing in China and other inefficient emerging markets. Jason also helped found Research Affiliates, is a, board, a member of the board of directors at the Anderson School of Management at UCLA, as well as an adjunct professor in finance, and is an associate editor of the Journal of Investment Management, among other journalistic publications. Jason, welcome to the program. Dan, glad to be here. So Jason, it looks like um, we, we really have two topics with you today. We have China and perhaps more generally emerging markets. And then we have this style of investing of yours, which you call quantumental, which is obviously a portmanteau of quantitative and fundamental. And I'm, I'm really interested in getting into that. I've read some of the explanation on the website, so I have a basic idea what you're, what you're doing. But maybe we could talk about China first, because I know that's something that's definitely on our listeners' minds. At Stansbury, we've written quite a bit about China. So why do you choose to focus on China? If you think about China today, uh, it certainly is the second largest uh, economy. Uh, it is 
rising rapidly uh, and likely to overtake the U.S. I think by 2025 in terms of just total GDP. So it's too large to ignore, but yet it is a minuscule portion of the investor's portfolio. And so the question is, should you have more? Do you need more? What are the opportunities? And these are fascinating questions, I think, for all investors and uh, their advisors. Uh, my focus on China in part was driven by the highly anticipated greater inclusion of China into global benchmarks. And you know that's going to drive, at least uh, for passive investors, just an automatic indexing and rebalancing to China. And certainly, uh, I think for more active investors, you like to get ahead of that flow. And for managers, you like to get ahead of that opportunity and really build out capabilities and expertise today. I think I'm going to use a overused cliche here. It's about skating to where the puck will be instead of skating to where the puck is. And so that that's really my my entire MO for building out a, a dedicated China capability today. Okay. That, you know, I know a lot of people use that expression, but I, I think it fits. It sounds great. So the first thing, unfortunately, the first thing some people think of still, I'm afraid, when they talk about investing in China, you know, about buying individual securities is the issue of fraud that has come up. And, I, you know, I have this book on my shelf. What's well, not there now. My whole library is in boxes because we're moving. But I do have this book called Asian, I think it's called Asian Financial Statements or Asian Financial Analysis or something like that. And the subtitle is Detecting Financial Irregularities. But it strikes me that the main title on there is just very generic. And yet it's a whole book about detecting fraud. And there are famous examples, Sino Forest and Harbin Electric, Puta Coal. There's there's a bunch of others in there. So that seems to me like a little bit of a hurdle to get over. Uh, is is it still as much of a hurdle as it was? H how do you feel about that today? Uh, Dan, so first of all, there is no denying uh, that the bad reputation uh, is partly uh, earned. Uh, so if you look uh, even as recently as last year, uh, you know, Muddy Water had a report out and, and ultimately uh, this Chinese firm listed in the U.S., uh, Luckin Coffee, was found to have fabricated fake coffee receipts to the tune of about $200 million, of course, uh, all in the service of driving up their share prices so the chairman uh, could dump his shares. So I think the two points I want to make here, uh, one is about the adverse selection. The average selection issue here refers to a lot of Chinese companies list in the U.S. and subsequently blow up because listing standards in the U.S. is just significantly lower than listing standards in, say, China with the two stock exchanges there or even in Hong Kong. So the U.S. stock market actually faces, when it comes to Chinese companies, this average selection problem. Uh, companies that fail listing requirements or their backers are known to be financial manipulators come to the U.S. and leverage all of that information asymmetry uh, to essentially take advantage of uh, U.S. investors. And I think, you know, our regulators are, are sort of finally catching up to that and putting in uh, policies to help alleviate some of those concerns with the uh, Holding Foreign Company Accountable Act. So that's one point I want to make, which is yes, you know that that poor reputation is is partially uh, earned, and and uh, investors should be concerned by by that problem. But it's, I think, significantly more concentrated with the Chinese firms that list uh, in the U.S. Now, I'm gonna sort of pivot a little bit and talk about what about the Chinese firms that list um, locally in China, either on the Shanghai Stock Exchange or the Shenzhen Stock Exchange. Clearly, there is still a great variety of firms that uh, you know have different accounting standards, and some are conservative, some are aggressive. When we look at the data, uh, there is in fact widespread data massaging, but the surprising fact is, most of the time, most of the firms massage their earnings downward, not upward. 
So quite the opposite of what you expect. Okay, so it is massaging, but it's massaging the numbers downward. Now, why would you do that? They do it because uh, the rules in China are different than in the U.S. The stock exchanges in China are quite paternalistic in the sense that they think they need to protect the end investor. And the way they do so is requiring companies to be profitable all the time. Uh, so if you have negative earnings one year, uh, the exchange will come and kind of slap you on the wrist, maybe even slap you in the face. If you do it again the next year, um, heavy sanctions are imposed. Um, your st stock's liquidity essentially dries up because they take away your ability to margin those shares, very tight cap on daily price movements. And of course, if you, you know, lose money again, you're on, you know, on course to be delisted. Uh, and companies are terrified of that. And so what they do is whenever they have a strong earnings uh, year, they will underreport it to build up a reserve. If they have a bad year where they absolutely have to report a negative number, they will report a much larger negative number. Uh, again, all, all in service of building up a reserve to smooth out earnings. So if you think about it, uh, a company like Amazon, uh, Netflix, uh, even Apple in the early days, uh, they, they would have been delisted in China many times over. And so a lot of what companies do in China, you may not want to interpret that as sort of fraudulent manipulation to drive up stock prices by misrepresenting earnings, but more of a uh, earnings smoothing management to, to essentially uh, avoid some of these unintended consequences uh, put into place by, um, by the exchange. I see. And I just want, um, for our listeners' sake, Jason, uh, Jason used this term, averse selection. If you know it at all, you probably know it in the insurance industry with something like flood insurance, where the only people who seem to get flood insurance are the ones who live in floodplains. So they're, <laughs> they right. averseely select, right? So, so the, only, the, co the companies that commit the worst fraud, we're saying, in, in China are listed in the U.S. So we've aversely selected for those, those companies. But Jason, you, you, you make an interesting point about the difference between Chinese and U.S. regulation. And I have to say, there's also for our listener on, on Radiant.com, Jason has a research note called Tiger Mom versus Montessori, a simple analogy for comparing Chinese and U.S. financial regulation. You know, as I, as I read through this, it seemed to be a relatively straightforward comparison of the two approaches, um, which you've just sort of laid out for us. But Jason, I, I swear to you, as I came to the end of it, I, was, I almost thought that it, you were of a mind to to believe that the Chinese system should be more like the U.S. and not vice versa. Did, it was just the beginning of a feeling. Do I have that at all right? Well, I think it's uh, not just me. I think uh, as I speak to many regulators in China, I think they hold that belief as well. Uh, you know, the the U.S. system, you know, being very hands off, uh, is built on the belief that look. Uh, if you if you make a mistake, you'll learn from it, and uh, and you'll either be better or you simply would sort of exit the game, right? So when it comes to the stock market, it's not the job of the regulators or the exchange to make sure only good companies with great management uh, get to list, right? Bad companies with bad management, look, investors, uh, you know, consenting adults making deals. Uh, if you lose money, if you invest in a bad company. Uh, you'll learn from it and don't do it. Maybe you'll learn to delegate to the more professional uh, funds manager instead of trading stocks yourself. That's kind of the U.S. attitude. Uh, China uh, has taken the other approach where uh, the exchange goes out of its way to engage companies uh, to make sure you know bad management team uh, gets a talking to uh, firms with uh, disastrous stock price performance are sent the warning all in the hope that uh, they can protect otherwise um, less sophisticated individual investors who, who perhaps you know, don't understand how stock market works, um, don't read financials. But the result of that is uh, you continue to, to have a lot of 
sort of noise traders, right? Individuals who simply don't learn from their bad experience and that reduces the quality of the overall market and the regulators almost have to work, you know, doubly hard uh, just to, to maintain order in a market that's otherwise uh, extremely noisy and inefficient. So you know, when I speak with regulators, the thing they want more than anything else is to attract long-term U.S. disciplined capital that could come in and discipline prices, right? To have market mechanism uh, do its work rather than having regulators do that work. Uh, so yeah, in, in the short run, maybe it's very efficient to have a, a tiger mom or tiger dad to just sort of come in and, and sort of dictate how things ought to work. But really, I think in the long run, there is something to be said about um, the market mechanism and really having the participants learn uh, and sort it out instead of having the regulators playing, you know, you know, judge and jury all the time. You know, this sort of that last comment um, of yours reminds me, it reminds me a little of Jim Rogers, who's been very bullish on China for, for a couple of decades here. And every now and then he'll say, you know, in some ways, China's more capitalistic or more free market or something than the US. Do you agree with that? And and if so, like, how is it true, if it is true at all? So there's a very interesting dichotomy in that, in terms of the regulatory environment, uh, the ethos is much less capitalistic uh, and much more, I would say, uh, interventionist, right? So it's not about trusting the invisible hand of the market. It's actually very distrusting of that. Uh, and, and as a result, government intervention is often viewed as necessary and perhaps wise because the market can't be trusted. Now, the part that is true about cap, um, China being more capitalistic is that the, the participants are certainly extremely profit aware and profit driven, right? So the amazing growth story you see in China today does come from, you know, people incredibly willing to outwork, you know, other people to put in crazy eye banking hours, even if you're not working eye banking job, uh, to outcompete globally, uh, to generate profits. Uh, so this this animal spirit of um, sort of responding to monetary incentives is stronger in China than any other country I ever visited, right? Whereas if you look at US and, and Europe uh, and Japan today, right? ESG investing, purpose investing, impact investing, where investors are saying, hey, I, I'm willing to make less money, lower return uh, for other reasons, right? It's not, you know, my investing uh, my work isn't purely profit driven, uh, and and that sort of ethos uh, almost point at kind of an anti capitalism, right? Capitalism requires you to be entirely you know selfish and sort of profit motivated, and so that's that's the dichotomy really in China is on the one hand you have you know just extreme uh, sort of profit motivated behaviors that's led to phenomenal growth, right? That's led to you know, everyone uh, acquiring tremendous amount of education and working tremendously hard and then producing prosperity and growth. Uh, but, you know, with a backdrop of a, a society that's also very distrustful of a market mechanism. I see. Right. So, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. I see. So let's talk now about, about this quantum mental approach of yours. Um, that you pursue at Radiant, obviously a portmanteau of quantitative and fundamental. And the obvious question, as far as I can see, is quantitative exactly how and fundamental exactly how. You know, we want to know that, like, about each of the pieces. And then I'm curious to know, you know, how do they how do they come together, rather than when I see something like that, I think, okay, it, are you just doing quantitative research and then you're doing fundamental research on the same stocks, let's say, or is there a true melding of those two somehow? 
do they really, you know, overlap in some way that you've discovered? You see what I'm trying to get at? I'm I'm unable to form a direct question, but no, 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 no. That that was super clear. A lot of people do quantum mental now. Uh, they they you know say on their website, say on their marketing material, they do quantum mental, and it's a little hard to figure out exactly what do they mean. Right? You see managers out there who have been traditional stock pickers, and I think they mean quantum mental by. Well, you know, we now use maybe computers to do some screening. Uh, we use computers to do some, you know, underlying factor analysis to help our stock pickers. And of course, you got quants going the other direction. Uh, and I think oftentimes they now mean maybe they'll have a team of fundamental guys just looking at the portfolio coming out of the machine just for a sanity check. Uh, what we at, at Raylian have been shooting to do is to truly create a, a melding, right? It's not, you know, one is a primary and the other one sort of is, you know, on the fringe. Uh, so what, what do we mean when we say quantum mental? It really starts with the fundamental part. Uh, we, it's not that we think pure quant, pure stat R, pure, you know, let the machine do what it does and the human get out of the way. You know, that, that could work. Uh, but our belief is uh, there is uh, something else that could work equally well. Uh, that is, if you take the deep insights that a fundamental analyst has about companies and markets and the investor's you know, behavioral psychology, so you really understand why something works, why something doesn't work, and then you quantify it, meaning you can write it down in a model so you can take data and test those hypotheses. And you can say, hey, you know, how reliable is this pattern? Uh, how often does it repeat? Uh, when it happens, um, you know, how much money can you make? How big is that alpha? And when it goes against you, how bad can it get? And what are sort of the extreme black swan event when you apply this kind of intuition? Uh, so it's really taking data and a scientific approach to model a lot of the intuitions that I think all the great investors, great managers, um, you know, have practiced. So that's what, what we mean by quantum mental. Uh, now you can't, mo you can't model everything. Uh, not, not all of that gut instinct can be modeled, but I think the science tells us a lot of it can be, and at least enough of it can be so that you are, uh, likely to produce something that is better than just a human acting on sort of gut instinct alone, right? Because you can then bring to that uh, approach, you know, the latest technology from machine learning, the latest empirical techniques, such that you can really tease out more information and also take risk into account more scientifically, all of which leads to, you know, better long-term success versus just a human doing it you know, alone without, uh, without the data science. So that's what we mean by quantum mental, right? It's moving away from a pure black box type of quant. Uh, and it's really sort of augmenting the human insight, but in such a way that uh, to a degree of accuracy and sophistication that a team of humans could never achieve. That's interesting to me. Jason, years ago, I went and I visited one of the turtle trader firms. I won't say which one it is. But I, I remember that the, the guy who was giving us a tour, he said, you know, if a trader doesn't follow the signal that our PhDs have developed on this big computer system, if they don't follow the signal, they can get fired. And then he said, I'm going to leave you in the hands of our head trader here. And he walked away and the head trader showed us a chart and he said, and it was, it was cable, it was the, the British pound. And it went down five days in a row and the, si and the computer spit out a sell signal. And he said, but do you really want to short it after five days of this? So we didn't short it. So, so, so right away, like that was my introduction to, you know, to this idea that, you know, following the, just getting humans out of the way is probably never going to happen. So, you know, over the years, I, I, I I'm happy to talk to you. And I, we talked to actually um, Jim Mesturzo yeah. from Research Affiliates, you know, and I, and I know you co-founded co that firm. And, and we've talked to other folks over the years. And I have to say, I always drill in to that question. 
And it makes perfect sense to me that what you guys are doing is saying, of course you'd never do that. And then you, you're systematic on sort of both sides of it, the discretion versus the pure quantitative output, which, which to me makes people like, makes Renaissance technologies this sort of head scratcher, you know? It's like, wow, it's just amazing. But maybe they're, the, maybe they're just the exception to the rule and, and, you know, the world is really headed in the direction of Raylient. Perhaps, I don't know. I mean, Dan, you're absolutely right, right. When you, when you think about, you know, the, the legends that we, 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 you know, memorialize in, in books, right? Those are really the outliers. They're the exceptions, right? They're not what's repeatable, right? We can all read Steve Jobs, you know, biography, Elon Musk's maybe, and, and, and Jim Simons, right? That those are great for storytelling, but if that's very replicable, uh, I think we have a lot more uh, billionaires today. Um, and so, you know, those books really aren't a, a recipe for success, right? They're a recipe for what's unlikely to repeat again. And, and really for, for most everyone else, uh, it really is about, well, what can you reliably repeat? And, uh, and then I would say, uh, you know, something that has, uh, intuition inside and married with data science uh the data science part is very much figuring out what what's likely to repeat and really the human insight there is to make sure that well sometimes the data science uh can get it wrong or sometimes the the machine can get it wrong and so when there's human intuition uh, at least you can relate to what comes out of the machine and be able to detect what doesn't make sense Right. And it's interesting too, isn't it, that the melding of these two things, it seems to me that the way it's happened is we've applied more data science and more insights uh, from, you know, studies in behavioral finance and things. It seems like there's more science being applied to the fundamental side rather than, you know, doing anything at all with the quant, you know, the quant strategies are what they are. I mean, it's, it is a black box and, and it, it puts out what it puts out, and then you have to figure out, you know, what you're going to do with it. It seems like, but overall, I think you're there's a there's a good point in here, which is, and I've made it before. If you're picking stocks by, you know, it's just sort of the normal way, you read about things in the paper, and you know, you believe that you know what a good business is when you see one, and you know what an overvalued business is when you see one. You've got serious competition. I mean, people like you and even research affiliates, you know, let alone, like, you know, Renaissance or anybody who's doing something with a fair amount of money, the competition is getting more, it's getting more fierce, it seems to me. The more folks like you apply this, these models to the fundamental side, it just seems like it's getting more and more difficult. Do you think that's right? That's absolutely right. And while it's bad news for people like myself, it's generally good news for the end consumer, you know, basically investors into uh, funds, you know, big pension funds and sovereign wealth funds who, who hire managers like, like myself. Uh, and then, you know, that's, that's the beauty of competition and I guess of the capital market uh, as we compete and, and you know, drive down prices uh, and drive up market efficiency and drive up outcome for clients. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's, it's what kind of the invisible hand, uh, desires, right? It, it wants the competition to compete away profits for managers and to, uh, generate better social, uh, welfare overall. So, you know, um, I, I think that's, that's, that's all, that's all good. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, the, I think that, there's an interesting point there in that the fact that, you know, quant managers or good managers uh, start to do similar things and these similar things then, uh, you know, start to sort of crowd out each other. At least it says that there's some kind of universal truth, at least when it comes to investing and valuation, right? There is universal agreement in terms of, you know, what is a good stock? Uh, what is a good investment? What are good practices? Uh, and and that 
you know, at least make our business uh, and make this science, this craft respectable, right? What would be concerning would be a lot of people, a lot of managers competing and they all do completely different things. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you know, neither the client or the market's better for it. You know, that, that would be the concerning outcome. I hope you don't mind me jumping around on topics a little bit. I noticed, you know, we, we talked about modeling what great investors do and so forth. But I, I noticed on your website, you know, you have some, some material about your values and your principles. And right up at the top, one of the biggest ones is, is says we are deeply opposed to manager ego and all it represents. Right. We strive for authenticity and humility and, and education and perspective and, all. you know, it's it's this anti ego kind of a thing that is very interesting to me because, look, we're all human. Right. It's we're human beings. And the, the, the dynamics of a group of people doing something is that, you know, one guy gets all the credit. Right. And it's typically the guy at the top. So we say, boy, that Jason Sue, he's an amazing investor. Like no matter how many times you tell me that you're opposed to manager ego and all it represents, I know people are going to say, wow, Jason Sue, he's smart. How do you, you know, you're fighting human nature there, aren't you? How do you do that in your firm on a day to day basis? What kind of culture do you have to have to really, you know, act on that principle? Well, there are a couple of dimensions. So I, so Dan, I apologize. I'm going to give you a, a long answer here. Uh, and then I'm giving a long one because this is super important. So I'm going to start with a story, All right? Uh, you know, I, I, I once, you know, saw an incredibly successful, uh, you know, investment manager, uh, speak to a group of, uh, kind of aspiring young, you know, financial engineers. And uh, he was explaining why investment managers uh, make many hundreds of thousands, uh, even millions, while say, you know, school teachers and, and engineers uh, make significantly less than that. And he was explaining, well, that's what the market's telling us. We need more bankers and hedge fund managers and less of the other stuff. And it just struck me. It's like, wow. Here's someone who's incredibly intelligent. Um, and, and yet, because of market failure, that uh, some of us have become so grossly overpaid. Uh, and the hubris, instead of feeling a little, you know, embarrassed by the, 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 the windfall, just the hubris of wanting to feel like we deserve it, we earned it, we come to a conclusion where we point to the market failure and say, no, 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 that's actually the market working perfectly fine. And we are not just worth it, we are better than, right? And that bothered me tremendously. Uh, and so part of when I point to sort of manager ego, it's it's about that, right? You're, you know, we're in an industry where people are paid well, and that's an understatement. Uh, I think we're in an industry where uh, just about everyone is overpaid. And yet we try to give it a spin, right? We try to justify that by saying, no, no, it's because we generate more value. And then, then that bothers me. And I, I feel like it it starts to sort of corrode the individuals in this industry and, and um, you know, kind of set us on a, a bad path. Uh, so now from that, that's sort of pitting that to what does it mean for, for you know, my firm and, and kind of the culture we're trying to build. Well, a part of it is really to, to be aware of, like, there's a difference between the price you can negotiate and the value you generate. And if you always keep that in mind, not only are you going to be a, a more sensible investor, uh, you're just going to be a more sensible human being. Uh, and like you say, within an organization, if you keep that in mind, right, then when you take more credit than is due you, yeah, you negotiated a big price, but you didn't really deliver on an equivalent value and, and you should feel bad about that. And that's the kind of culture we want to make sure we have. Uh, if you feel like, hey, you know, success looks like when I generated more value than the price I extract. So I'm leaving something for someone else, right? 
someone's interaction with me resulted in a good deal for it, right? If that's how you feel about, uh, you know, having purpose and building value, uh, I think you're going to be a wonderful colleague to work with. You're going to be a wonderful person to do business with. Uh, and in the long run, uh, that's going to attract the right kind of client. That's going to attract the right kind of colleagues and that's going to build good business. Uh, so that's, that's really kind of at the core of um, Raylian's ethos. Sounds like Costco. <laughs> I love Costco. Yes. Pass the value along to the consumer. Don't, you know, don't just, you know, keep, don't keep the margin high. Keep it as low as possible. So do you keep fees as low as possible at Raylian? Well, we, uh, we certainly uh, make fees fair. Uh, we can't quite go to Vanguard, which is a mutual, which makes them, you know, non-profit. Um, but that's sort of energetically certainly a, a aspiration, right? We want to make sure that we're charging fair and that we're not charging when we aren't delivering. So we, all of our products uh, have a version where investors can choose to not pay unless uh, we deliver alpha. Uh, and then that's something that, that's sort of front and center when, um, when we engage with clients is, you know, a, it's not just about the return we generate for you what's more important is about the fee we charge right are we charging you so much that really even for great managers we all the benefit accrues to us not to you right that would be grossly unfair uh, and then of course there's research that points to actually some managers they charge so much that not only do they take all the benefit from their investment services uh, they actually take more than that so clients always get sort of a net of fee a negative alpha so we're certainly very opposed to that way of doing business and certainly opposed to that outcome. Uh, and then we, you know, have a fee that uh, sort of avoids that, right? If you only pay if we outperform, uh, then we're maximally both aligned in, ser in terms of our, our desired outcome, uh, but also, you know, some of that, uh, you know, heads, I win, tails, you lose sort of an asymmetric outcome goes away as well. Well, we could certainly use a lot more of that in the financial world. You know, heads, heads I win, tails, you lose. It seems to be the norm. But I, I have to admit, you know, thanks to, you know, people like you and, and you know, the, from Vanguard all the way to people like you and everything in between, there, there seems to be a movement that, hey, it's time to stop charging egregious fees and saying that, you know, whatever the market will bear, hey. But investors are pushing back too. So it's not just, it's not just from within the industry. Eventually people get tired of not making any money and, and you know, buying billionaires new yachts and stuff. So, you know, I, I like what you're doing and, and people can read more about this on your website. Let's talk about specific strategies. Um, you guys have, you, there's a tab on your website on Raylian.com and there are four strategies, China Managed Futures, China All Alpha, Quantum Mental Emerging Markets, and Quantum Mental China. What's the difference? We talked about Quantum Mental, so we apply those principles to emerging markets in general and China specifically. What's the difference? What's China All Alpha about? What, how is that different from Quantum Mental? Our China All Alpha product uh, tries to be a fixed income replacement solution. You know, what we see globally is that if you buy fixed income, it's really no longer risk-free return. Uh, it's probably much more return-free risk, right? Yields are really low and uh, the risk of the rate going up and creating large capital losses for your fixed income is high, or if rate stays low and inflation continues to run in the background because of so much money printing, again, you're a loser. Uh, so people want to move out of fixed income, just they don't want to move into equities. Uh, a lot of pension funds are maturing and perhaps going into decumulation mode, meaning they have to sell their assets to fund uh, retirement payments, so they can't take equity risks. So then people are stuck, right? You, 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 you don't want fixed income because it doesn't really deliver a return and, and there's quite a bit of risk. You can't move to equities. That's just more volatile than, than you can afford uh, to handle at this stage. 
so what what can you do uh, so we've been we've been looking to create a fixed income replacement solution that tries to be as diversified as possible uh, so that it could mimic at least uh, sort of you know intermediate uh, horizon bond portfolio but just with a significantly better return uh, now China happens to be a part of that solution uh, there are a lot of uh, beta sources so you know commodities um, different uh, index derivatives different uh, equities instrument large cap small cap micro cap uh, if you blend all of that and these because they up to this point, not been accessed by global investment communities, uh, they become a great diversifier to existing alternative portfolios, existing sort of quasi fixed income solutions out there. Uh, and so when we built the China Oil Alpha Fund, it's really with the uh, eye toward uh, you know, global alternative uh, funds, you know, be a multi-strategy or fund of funds manager could include this as a part of their overall portfolio diversifier and uh, and instantly reduce the volatility of their portfolio and produce more return. Uh, so that's what we, we, we've sort of created. Uh, so within that strategy, basically anything and everything you could invest in China will be in there. Uh, not only do you get sort of these uncorrelated diversifying beta sources that uh, you couldn't buy elsewhere, uh, but because China, across all of its markets, are heavily retail driven, so the alpha reservoir is is quite large and quite persistent. Uh, so you you get to package that in uh, as a another uncorrelated source of return as well. Uh, so that's our China Oil Alpha Fund uh, in in a nutshell. Okay, we we've actually been talking quite a while, but I do I have two more things. Your let's talk about your new ETF, which seems to have been on the market for just a f- few months here. It's the ticker symbols R A Y C, and it's called the Radiant Quantumental China Equity ETF. So that would be your your Quantumental China strategy in an ETF, and you, and you say it's the f- world's first active ETF in China. That is, so this is, uh, you know, your little marketing tagline here: the next generation of China ETFs. So um, you know, maybe we'll see more more active China ETFs, but this is the first one, huh? It's the first one, yeah. We, we've been obviously running our China quantum mental strategy onshore in China and also for global institutions for a while. Uh, you know, we, we have now reached a three-year track record, which is, you know, why we thought it makes sense now to make that available to essentially, you know, U.S. financial advisors and U.S. individual investors in the format of an active ETF. So, in fact, it is the first uh, China active ETF listed anywhere in the world. Uh, I think New York Stock Exchange was uh, very, very happy to point that out to us. Uh, and, and thus, we're, we're very happy to you know, remind any and everyone whenever uh, we, we go on podcast to talk. <laughs> right. Okay. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, documents, prospectus, fund prospectus, fact sheet, and an overview all on... Uh, on the Radiant that you can get to on the Radiant website. So it, it is actually time, Jason, for my final question, which is the same question for every guest of the podcast. And the question is simply this. If you could leave our listener with a single thought today, what might that be? See, see the emergence of China and the resulting tension between US and China, not as a, you have to pick a winner and bet on that winner and take sides. You know, see it as a virtuous co-opetition. Right? Don't see it as US versus Russia during the Cold War days, but see it as US versus Japan as Japan was emerging. And that emergence ultimately meant more business for both sides. Uh, another source of interesting beta to invest in and uh, that through this sort of healthy co-opetition the world's more prosperous everyone's better off so if you keep that in mind you'll realize this isn't about uh, forecasting which stock market will have the better return uh, but it's about understanding that both will have fantastic returns driven by more prosperity and that you want to be diversified 
and have both winners in the long run. I think that's a great message. That's exactly right. And it's great for investors, right? Because the, you know, the more winners there are to pick, the better it is for everybody. And, and it reminds me of the old Avis car rental commercial, you know, China's second, so they try harder, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's actually been a real pleasure to talk with you. I hope that we can do it again sometime. It's, it's been a tremendous pleasure for me as well, Dan. I hope we get to speak very soon. All right. Talk to you again sometime. Bye-bye. That was pretty neat. And I do encourage you to go to Radiant's website. It's Radiant.com. And th this the ETF is tiny. We didn't get a chance to spend much time talking about it. But it's, it's tiny. Different sources are giving me different numbers. But it looks like it's maybe $10 million in, in net assets. So it's really tiny. And you'd want to read about that. You know, tiny is by definition less liquid. So you got to be careful. But, I mean, these guys seem really worried about how they treat their clients. And and there's more to read at Raylian.com about that too. Pretty cool. I, it's, it's always good to discover like a brand new investor that you didn't know anything about who's who's got their head in the right place. And I think they do. I think they have their heads in the right place. All right. Very cool. Let's look at the mailbag now. Let's do it right now. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Just send your questions, comments, and politely worded criticisms to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. Or you can give us a call at our listener feedback line. That's 800-381-2357. Just tell us what's on your mind at 800-381-2357. Kind of a light mailbag this week. You know, I exercise discretion. I, I, I read them all, and I do respond to as many as time allows. But, you know, it's also like as many as are really compelling me to answer them. And that was a grand total of one this week. And Hank C. was, was that one. Hank C. writes in and says, Hi, Dan. You have for some months recommended value investors get exposure to Bitcoin. Typically, that involves a rather complicated process of setting up a Coinbase account, depositing cash into it, then acquiring digital tokens that can get lost or maybe even hacked. Now there is a Canadian ETF with a U.S. ETF apparently in the works, both of which are meant to make Bitcoin ownership a lot easier. I was surprised to learn a few months ago about the Grayscale Bitcoin Unit Trust, symbol GBTC. It's been around for about two years and can be bought in the over-the-counter market, just like a stock or ETF. It appears to be structured somewhat like the gold and silver units available from Sprott today. The net asset value, of course, trails that of Bitcoin itself. Do you think this equity is a viable substitute for buying Bitcoin directly? Please keep up all of your good work for us value investors. Regards, Hank C. Hank, I don't know a lot about the Grayscale Trust, but I, I to me, I, I prefer to buy it more directly. It's just kind of my a quirk of my personality. You know, these things... They're never direct substitutes. You mentioned the Sprott Gold and Silver Trusts, right? So you can redeem those for metal, but the gold metal is like good delivery bars from London. So, you know, that's a 400-ounce bar. So anything below that, you're going to get in cash if you try to redeem. So, you know, it's it's mainly geared towards... If, if redemption is part of your deal with that, if you if you plan to redeem, it's geared towards a larger investor, obviously. And I and you know redeeming, I don't know what the redemption feature is on the Grayscale Trust, but but it seems like buying an ETF and redeeming and Bitcoin, it just adds a, it would add a lot of noise to it. So is it a viable substitute for buying Bitcoin directly? I don't. Ultimately, I have to be honest. I don't know, but. My question is, I, I can only answer the question with a question, why would you buy the ETF if you could just buy Bitcoin? And I, I, I get what you're saying, that it's a complicated process, but I've been representing to people that the process is really easy because I'm comparing it to setting up an online brokerage account, which is a, ma you know, that's a major hassle, right? There's, there's a lot of stuff to do. Whereas with Coinbase, I mean, I was up and running pretty quick, like almost, you know, right away. You're, you're just filling out a bunch of stuff, 
online, which which I thought was a lot less to fill out than for a brokerage account, and then you know deposit some cash and away you go. And actually, I didn't even have to deposit cash. I'm I'm just linked to my you know to a cash account that that uh, feeds it. You know, so when I when I sell, I'll have cash in my Coinbase account, but you know, let's say I take all of that out and I buy, it just comes out of my cash account that I have linked at the bank. So, yeah, I, you know, I thought it was really easy. And to me, I'm like, well, why wouldn't you do this? Because it was so easy. So you and I are kind of at different places on, on what's easy and what's complicated. For me, there's no substitute. I just want to have Bitcoin. I want to be able to buy Bitcoin and and potentially even take it offline and put it in a in a wallet in, in you know cold storage uh, so that it can't can't be accessed by anyone good question though and i brought it up even though i don't know the answer and don't really care about the grayscale bitcoin trust because it's something people should think about you know do w- do you want to buy bitcoin directly do you want to put it in cold storage or just kind of leave it in your account on coinbase or whatever do you want to you know, buy this ETF. You say there's a U.S. ETF coming out, like the, like the Canadian one, and there's this unit trust, the Grayscale Trust. How do you want to own it? And it's it's a great question, Hank. And it's rather than me, you know, questions are better than answers. Questions beat the hell out of answers any day of the week. And I would even go so far as to say it's a hallmark of this podcast. That's why I don't worry about whether or not I even know anything about the Grayscale Trust, and I'll take the question. Because questions beat the hell out of answers, period. All right? Thank you, Hank. Well, that's another mailbag, and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you're listening to this episode and you really enjoy it, send somebody else a link to the podcast so we can continue to grow. Anybody you know who might also enjoy the show, just tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. Do me a favor. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. Also follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. If you have a guest you want me to interview, drop me a note at feedback at investorhour.com or give me a call at the new listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell me what's on your mind, 800-381-2357. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to investorhour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email, feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.